This is the Arts and Learning Conservatory's Interviews with the Industry, and we are so excited to have Carla Stickler here, who is a Broadway actress and software engineer who just came back from being Alphaba on Wicked on Broadway again. So Carla, if you could just tell us a little bit about who you are and what your journey was into Broadway acting and into software engineering and back. Sure. Wow. Um, so it's a little bit of a long uh, journey. I'll try to make it sort of brief, but um, I basically have been performing since I was pretty young. I come from a really musical family. Um, I did a lot of shows when I was in high school and when I was younger, um, I went to a performing arts high school in Northern Michigan called Interlochen. Um, I went there for summer and for high school. And when I was there, I actually um, discovered I liked doing a lot more than just musical theater um, and singing. So I did pottery and I painted and um, and I also was a voice major and then I also did musical theater. So I did a lot of different things. Um, so my senior year of high school, I actually focused on voice. So I thought I was gonna be an opera singer. I went to college for opera. Um, I went to Cincinnati Conservatory of Music for a year. And um, I had a little vocal trauma in the middle of the year. I ended up having to have surgery to have a cyst removed and I dropped out of school. Um, and it was kind of one of the first moments where I was like questioning what I wanted to do with my arts and what, I, like who I was. Um, and I spent some time at home, took some time off from school and I decided I wanted to be an actor. So I went to NYU and I studied just acting. Um, I didn't sing for a few years. Um, I just was like, I'm going to be the best actor ever. Um, but the funny thing is I've always, I always like doing other things, right? So like, while I was at NYU, I took a pottery class and I was in an acapella group because that was fun and no pressure singing. And, um, cause I was like really terrified of like singing professionally at that point, um, or like having goals of being a singer just because of what had happened. And I didn't do any plays while I was at NYU. Like I didn't do like a single play. Um, and I, I really, I really felt very lost. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I've always kind of been a person who's had a lot of things that I like, but also a little bit terrified of, um, failing to be totally honest. So, um, before my senior year of college, I, to get some credits out of the way, so I graduated on time, I did NYU's cap 21, which is their musical theater program. And I really struggled through it. I was, I was really terrified to like start singing again and like, let myself relearn what that was. And I, figured it. I like, I cried every day during the program and my teachers were like, Carly, you're really good at this. You should be doing this. And I was like, I think I should be doing this. Um, and I spent my whole senior year just like trying to figure out how to be a musical theater performer on my own. I like got a private teacher and I took classes as every like musical theater class that I could. And I was really fortunate that I ended up getting an agent out of school and I started working and I worked pretty much nonstop. Um, but what led me to software engineering is kind of funny. And I think, I think a lot of it really ties to this thing of me always kind of trying to figure out who I am and like where I fit in with my creativity. Um, and I love performing, but I've also never felt like I am solely a performer. I've always felt like I am a creator. Um, and the thing that I love that always brought me back to pottery is actually a very similar feeling that I found when I discovered software engineering. Um, this idea of like building something from scratch that I, I took something out of nothing and made something beautiful. And, and when I discovered software engineering, I was like, oh my God, it's the same kind of feeling that I get when I, when I make a mug or a bowl or whatever. Um, and that for me was like tapped into that very different side of creativity that I've always really longed for. Um, but also uh, could provide a life that I wanted, you know, a life with stability and health insurance and weekends and evenings and, and a family and life and, you know, like getting to go to weddings and experience being a part of a community and that, you know, isn't just based completely around the actors that I work with. So um, it, it really opened a lot of doors to a lot of things that I didn't realize that I really wanted with my life. And I was like, cool, I get to have all the things that I want. I get to be creative and I get to have a house and not have to live in New York city if I don't want and have flexibility. Um, and it was, it, it was really cool. Like I, I'm, I love, I love being a software engineer now. Like, um, I miss performing a little bit if I'm totally honest, but, um, right now I'm trying to figure out what does that balance look like? Maybe I can do a little bit on the side. I don't know.
That's great. So what did it feel like to go back to Broadway after so long? Yeah, um, it was really nice. I, I think I wasn't, ex- I wasn't expecting it, right? So um, I, I really didn't think that I would ever, I, when I left, when I moved to Chicago in April, I really thought I was done. Um, and so to have the opportunity to kind of go back and revisit this role that I had played forever ago, you know, but, but with like a completely different perspective. Um, as, as somebody who has gone through a lot of just the past seven years since I played her last, I am a, I am a completely different person. You know, I feel like I'm a much more grounded person. I feel like I am a happier person. I feel like I, you know, I know who I am a little bit more. Revisit that role in a way where I get to bring all of that into it, you know, and to feel Elphaba's groundedness, um, was really powerful. It was, it was such a different experience playing that role than I'd ever felt before. That's interesting. Um, so how did you become, and you did touch on this in the first question, how, but how did you specifically become inspired with both the performing and technological arts? Did you have an aha moment for either of those? And similarly, one of our students submitted a question asking what the similarities are between being a Broadway actress and a software engineer. Awesome. Great question. Okay. So the, so the thing that kind of inspired me to get into software engineering is kind of a a very random thing. Um, I had a friend who was a musician who I had worked with and he showed up at my birthday party one year and was like, Hey, guess what? I'm a software engineer now. (laughs) And I, I was so confused and in awe of that because so it was like this thing, right. Where I don't think I realized that I've been waiting for somebody to like say the word software engineer to me. But the second he said them, I was like, Oh my God, I think I can do that. Even though I had no idea what it was. Um, I was just like at this place in my life where I was trying to figure out what else to do. I wasn't really happy with what I was doing at the moment. I was very stressed out about money and, um, you know, where my next projects were going to come from. And the second he said it, I was like, oh, that's so interesting. I feel like I could do that. And I like went home and I started teaching myself how to code online. And, you know, it was that feeling. It was like pottery, right? It was like, I sat down and I, and I was like, oh, I'm, I just created this thing that like now functions in my browser and I can like see it. And it's, it's just like a bunch of things that I wrote on, you know, over here and, and now it's over there and it's like working. And, um, I was just like, so inspired by that. The fact that I could like actually create something and on my computer, which is like so accessible. So I have access to this thing and I can do this from home. And I would just sit on my couch for hours and hours and I would lose track of time and I would forget to eat and I would get dehydrated. <laughs> And I was just like, I, I, I'm so into this thing. I, I think I need to, you know, investigate that and see what that is. Um, and so I really kind of dug into that. And I, the other part of your question was how are like, what are the similarities? Um, so it's funny, I think performing and, and software engineering, well, I'm not sure they're, they're the most similar things, right? Because performing, we're like on a stage, we're like very actively using our body and, and software engineering. I'm like very much you know, sitting at my computer and I'm not very physical, but I do think they do, they both kind of take a certain creativity. They take a certain, um, feeling of like confidence to kind of be like, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I can figure it out. Right. Especially for me as an understudy, where I would be on stage with people that I've never been with before. And you build that muscle of like, well, I'm in, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm here, I'm on stage. And I mean, I do know what I'm doing. I feel confident in my skills, but I also know there's a ton of unknowns. And with software engineering, there are always a ton of unknowns, you know, you're just problem solving. So a lot of times, you know, because technology moves so fast, I'm constantly learning new things. I have to, every time I take on a new project, I'm, I'm on the internet Googling, like, okay, how do I do this? Like, and I'm, I'm constantly learning how to do what I'm doing in the moment. And I think a lot of that that confidence in being able to tell myself, oh, I can, I can figure this out comes from that confidence I learned as a performer being like, oh, I can figure this out because I I know that I've figured out difficult things before. So this is no different. It's just, it's just a little less physical, um, a little more cerebral, but I'm, I'm, I'm convinced I, I'm not a dumb person. I'm, I've got to be smart somewhere in there. And so I'm like, I can figure this out. I know I can do this. Also, I think the beautiful thing about people in the arts kind of moving into technology is that we bring a lot of like empathy and we bring a lot of like different, like those soft skills that I think 
really help in tech. Um, I've been working on this really interesting project at work, um, making our site accessible for people who use screen readers and who can't see. And I found the thing I love about this project is I'm building something for other people, but like, as, because I bring the skill of empathy, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to help other people. I'm excited to see what our users want. I'm excited to kind of step out of myself and see what I'm building from their perspective and how it will affect them. And, um, and so it's really cool being able to kind of bring that into the job. Um, and also, you know, I'm really good at talking to people. I'm really good at, whether it's a good thing or not, I'm really good at interviewing. I'm really good at convincing people that I'm, that I know what I'm doing, that I'm competent. And I get that skill from theater because as an actor, you are always, you're, you, whether you feel it or not, you got to put it on and you got to walk into that room and you got to feel confident. Your job is to convince everybody else that you know what you're doing. Um, and so I'm very good at that and it definitely helps in my job. That's super interesting because I think part of the reason it made such news was this coder is now back on Broadway and those things seem so different, but they're not that different when you explain it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you were talking really a lot about confidence and we had um, one of our listeners asked, um, as someone who works closely with women in the tech field, she often finds confidence is an area of difficulty. Mm-hmm. And so um, her question is, what role has confidence played in your journey and has it evolved? Oh my God, it has evolved like bananas crazy so much. Um, I kind of like I touched on in the beginning, I, I always knew that I, I liked doing certain things, but I was never a very confident person. You know, I, I knew I liked singing, but I was not confident about it. And I, I was kind of always, I was always very terrified of failing. I was really scared to like, like if I put myself out there, if I allow myself to be vulnerable, there's a huge risk that I'm going to, I'm going to fall on my face and I'm going to fail. And it's going to be, it's going to be awful, right? There's this fear when, especially when we're young and we haven't experienced big failure yet, we, it can really like grab a hold of us and kind of take over and, and keep us from achieving things that we want to achieve because it can be like a huge blocker. And for me, I knew I needed to get over these things, but I was just, I, I didn't have a lot of confidence, um, especially with my voice. I, because I'd been having some vocal injury, some vocal issues for a long time. I knew I loved singing and I knew it felt good, but it, I kept having these blockers with it. And so I was, I was having a hard time building my confidence with it because I, I never knew what I was going to get every time I had to perform. And I was terrified of, of falling on my face and sounding terrible. Um, and I, I remember when I was younger, I used to dream, I, and this is awful, but I used to, I used to just be like, I wish I could never sing again. I wish like somebody would just take it away because the, the, the peace it would bring me of not having to try and risk failing was almost felt like it was a better, it was a better option than trying and failing. And so when I, when I quit singing after my surgery, I was like, this, this is it. I got the thing I wanted. I'm not going to sing. Um, but I found that wasn't, that wasn't enough for me. I think I, I wanted it. I wanted it to be true, but there was something about me wanting to be a performer that was stronger than my fear that was kind of dominating me, not deciding my decision not to do it. And so when I relearned how to sing and, and kind of step back into that, um, it was kind of one of the first times where I found myself learning how to like reclaim my power. Um, and it was very emotional. It was really hard. And I was really fortunate that I had a wonderful teacher who gave me space to kind of process while we were, while I was kind of rebuilding my voice and figuring out how, how it worked again, you know, in a very different way. And having gone through that experience allowed me to understand that confidence comes from overcoming things that terrify us, right? Knowing that when something is really scary, if we can get to the other side of it, if we can move through it, the other side is usually pretty okay. But when you're, when you're at the beginning of it or in the middle of it, it doesn't always feel like it's going to work out. Um, and the more we kind of allow ourselves to be vulnerable and, and admit that this is just the process, right? Stuff is scary. We got to move through it. 
and we got to get to the other side. And I promise it will be okay on the other side, but it, it just doesn't always feel like it's going to be in the moment. Um, and in my experience, I've had a lot of, I've unfortunately had a lot of moments like this in my life where like things have, things where I thought were going great have kind of fallen apart and I've had to figure out how to rebuild myself up from like a very low place. And every time I've done it, it's made me stronger. It's given me more confidence and it's made me realize that, you know what, I now, I now feel really comfortable that I know who I am and it's really helped me. Um, as I've shifted gears so many times into kind of these different fields, um, because I know that I know that while it's going to be hard now, it's going to be okay later. And I know that if I can kind of struggle through it and I can push through it and I can be confident about what I do know and who I am right at the core of like who I really am. And that I am a, I am the kind of person I'm a driven person. I, I will get through it and that it will be okay. I'm, I'm more likely to be confident in those situations. So I go to work and I know that I am not your typical engineer. And I know that I bring a crazy different energy to the room when I'm with my other colleagues, but I also don't let it bother me. I'm like, this is me. And I, and I know this is me because I've been through these other things and I've spent a lot of time learning who I am and building that up and figuring that out so that I can be confident and say, you know what, this is me, take me or leave me. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to like stop being the essence of who I am. Um, and that I have found when you, when you kind of conquer that a little bit and, and, you know, it's an evolving thing. We're always changing, you know, me now may be different than me five, 10 years later, but at the moment I know who I am. I know where I am and I feel very confident in that. And so it helps me get through those things that are tricky, um, and find my ways through them when I, when it feels like I don't know what's happening. And I, I feel like I'm in the dark. I'm like, I can be confident that I'm going to get there because I've gotten there before and, and it's been okay. And it's worked out. Nothing, nothing is ever that terrible. I have learned. <laughs> okay. Well, that's great advice. I think to just get through it and, and know that it's going to get better at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, what have you found to be the most transferable skills when you approach both of the professions and did they provide any insight into each other? Yeah. And I think I touched on this a little bit, but Mm. I think the, the most transferable skill I really think are, are the, the soft skills, obviously. I think, um, they're more transparent. They're more transferable than I think people realize they are. Um, but also the problem solving, I think, you know, as an actor, you are constantly trying to, you're, you know, you're researching a role, you're, you're trying to learn everything you can about a role and you're, you're studying it and you're tearing it apart from the inside out. You're trying to understand how it works. It's the same thing with software engineering. I am trying to understand how something works and I'm tearing it apart and I'm trying to get down to like the core of like, why does this thing do what it does so I can change it or fix it or whatever. Um, and I, I think, you know, we're all, we're detectives, right. In both ways, there, there are different ways of approaching it. There are different mediums through which we, we do our detective work, but they are similar. They take a similar kind of focus and energy, um, to want to figure it out. You know, that makes sense. I love, I love that response. I love that we're detectives. That's so cool. Yes. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to a young person with too many passions or with so many multiple interests? And I know you touched a little bit on how many things you were interested in when you were younger and same for me as well. We're often told to pick one and master it. And that clearly does not need to be the case. So what would your advice be for a young person that feels that way? Yeah, I would say it's okay to have lots of different interests. Um, I, that whole idea, right. You kind of said that you have to pick a thing. And if, if you, if you can't, if you can see yourself doing anything else, you should do that other thing. Right. And I, I think we, we kind of guide young people into these places too soon of having to decide who they want to be for the rest of their life, um, without acknowledging that, that, that can change and it can shift and it, it is not, you know, it's fluid. It's not set in stone just because 
your 16, 17 year old self decided that was what you wanted to go to college for. That's who you wanted to be. You know, like most of us probably wanted to be astronauts when we were like seven, you know, like that changed, um, you know, unless you're an astronaut and that is like totally cool and awesome. And if that's your goal, do it. But like, you know, I think our, our interest ebb and flow, and I think that's really important. And that is what makes us interesting people. So I think when, when you have lots of different interests, it's okay to explore them. You know, I think one thing that is important to recognize and, and is true for myself is that yes, there is something behind focusing on one for a period of time, right? Like I, I spent a lot of time focusing on being a musical theater performer. I, I went to school for it. I, I did classes. I, I literally lived and breathed music was living and breathing musical theater. But there are there was space in that for me to also do other things on the side, right? So I think also encouraging when you are deciding to focus on something that it's also okay to step away from that for a moment and then step back into it, right? I think that's what gives us perspective. The most interesting actors that I know are people who have a million other interests who do other things on the side, you know, because that's when you're fully immersed in one thing, it's hard to have any perspective on it. And that's when I think you start seeing actors who are a little desperate because they're like, I need this, I need this. I don't have anything else in my life because this is all that I do and it's all that I know and is my whole everything. I think it can ground you a lot when you have the ability to kind of step away and say like, oh, I also have this other thing over here that I love that I'm really passionate about. Um, But it's also important to remember that just because you decide to spend some time focusing on something, and then if if you decide you want to spend some time over here focusing on something, you know, spend a couple years here. I like to live my life that I'm going to live to 100. So if I'm going to live till I'm 100, that means I don't want to do the same thing for 100 years. That sounds really, really boring. So it's okay if I spend this, these years being an actor, and now I'm spending these years being a software engineer, or I spent many years being a teacher because I have, I, now I have all these skills and I'm, I'm, I'm in my late thirties. I have a lot of time left until I'm a hundred. So like I can now take all of these skills that I've learned and I can do all sorts of different things with them as I grow. And who knows, maybe one day when I'm 70, I'm going to live in New Mexico and I'm going to throw pottery all day long. And that's going to be my life. And that sounds awesome, but there's space and time for all of those things, you know, just because you pick a thing for a little bit of time. Doesn't mean if you move over here, you stop being that thing. You know, that thing still exists. You still have skills from that You can still bring them over here. And then sometimes go back over here and visit that other thing. Um, there's so much time to be all of those things. I love that. I love the whole idea that it's, it's great to just keep chasing your passions your whole life and be a lifelong learner. Mm -hmm. That's great. And that you don't stop being any one of those things. There's a lot of pressure to do that. I'm like, yeah, there's space. There is space for all of it. (laughs) <laughs> except on your resume that's running out of <laughs> and you no, gotta, there's no, you gotta have a website <laughs> yes yeah, really yeah. detailed linkedin page yes yeah. <laughs> so um how do you think we as educators can better support interdisciplinary learning yeah i think along those lines we can stop telling kids that they need to focus on one thing you know I, I spent a lot of time working with the Educational Theater Association and I, I, I would go to thespian festivals every year and I would, I would work with high school students. And even myself, I'm guilty of it, of being like, theater is a hard business. If you can't see yourself, you know, if you see yourself wanting to do something else, like go do that other thing. But, you know, I just don't, I don't think it's true. I, you know, and I, and I think I was kind of caught up in that old mentality of like, do this, you can only do this one thing and you have to be this one thing because it's really hard and it requires a lot of focus. And that is true. It does require focus. But even while I was telling people that I had a million other things that I was doing. And so, you know, now years later, I, I have such a different perspective on it. And I, and I just don't think it's true. I think we can support those things. We can encourage people in the arts to be well-rounded human beings. That's what 
that's what makes our art better. I think, you know, that's what makes us more interesting artists because we have all of these different perspectives that influence what we're doing. Um, you know, I, I think I did the best show of my life when I went back to Broadway because I, I brought in all of these new experiences with me that I wouldn't have had before, you know? And, and that was really magical to me. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I can be a singer. I can maybe revisit this part of my life without the pressure of it being my whole life, you know? So I think, I think there is space for that. I really, I really hope educators stop telling children that and, and start kind of twisting the narrative and saying, yes, this requires focus, but it doesn't mean you have to stop being a person, <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean you have to sacrifice all of these other things that you like and that you, you are interested in. There's time, there's space. And especially with the culture of what college did you get into and what are you going to major in? I have a senior this year, so that's close to my heart. And she's decided on community college. I could not be happier because I just feel like it's a lot to ask of a student to mm -hmm. know and to feel like they have a, a large financial decision to make. And, you know, with, with the money that it costs to go to college, they, mm -hmm. a lot of kids are feeling the pressure that they have to decide something really good that they're going to stick with. Mm -hmm. And I think a path can take all kinds of twists and turns. And I love everything that you're saying because it supports that. Yeah. I, you know, if I could go back and do it again, I would have taken a year off after high school. I needed, I just needed some space and I didn't know I needed it so bad. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, going ever spending your whole life in school <laughs> and going straight into another four years of school, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're like 18, whatever, you don't know anything about yourself. Um, I, I, I think I used to be so all about like, there's one path you have to go and do this, this. And now I know so many people who have taken so many different routes to get to where they are. And I just don't, I don't want to buy into that narrative anymore. I don't think it's true at all. I love all of that. And the space and perspective that all of the different kinds of being a software engineer or a Broadway actor, all of those provide perspective, sorry, to, to others, to other fields, that what you have as a software engineer can provide space and perspective to make you a better actress, and that maybe something within that acting makes you a better software engineer, and they're, they work in hand with each other. And we have one last question. If, if you could talk to a 10-year-old version of yourself about your life now, what would you be most excited to tell her about that you're comfortable sharing? I, you know, I would, I would be most excited to tell my 10 year old self that like, A, it's going to be okay. <laughs> right. Like you're going to get to do so many cool things and none of them are the things that you think you're going to do. And that's going to be awesome. You know, I think when I was 10, God, I was, I love musical theater. I was playing softball. I was a figure skater. Like I did so many, I think I, like, I thought I was going to be at the Olympics. Like I thought I, I had, I thought I was going to be so many things when I was 10 and I, I only did one of them, but like, I didn't end up going to the Olympics for figure skating, which is still a dream of mine, but I realized it's not going to happen. I'm probably too old. Um, but yeah, I would just, I would tell myself that, man, it is, it is going to be a crazy ride and it's going to be great. And you're going to be okay. And it's going to be awesome. And you're going to have a really good time. Yeah. Uh, nice and simple. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, I love that. I love that so much. Those are all of our questions. So thank you so much for all of your wonderful answers.